All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, we will get started now and let me minimize this. So tonight we're doing landscaping with succulents. Um, our instructor is gonna be Jennifer Alstrand and this is sponsored by the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. And I work with the city of Brisbane and we're part of that. Um, we are part of the groups that make up Bosca. So next slide. So for everyone participating today, everyone is muted. Um, the instructor will pause periodically for questions, but you are all encouraged to ask questions. So if you all wanna use the question and answer, then um, I can read the questions as they come up and then I'll probably group them. If I think she's gonna to get to the topic, I might hold off on your question, but I promise I'll get to all of them. And the webinar is being recorded. So if you wanna watch it again, that'll be an option. And there's a question and answer button. And so some people have already used the chat and I will uh, check both of them, I guess. But if you wanna do the Q and A button that I will check that first and that might pop up on my screen. So um, Bosca, that is a group that represents 26 agencies that include cities, water districts, a water company and a university that purchase water from the San Francisco regional water system. The Bosca member agencies, we provide water to almost 2 million people and over 40,000 businesses and community organizations dispersed through Alameda, Santa Clara and San Mateo County. Bosca's goal is to ensure a high quality supply of water at a fair price for everyone that's buying water from San Francisco. So the objectives of these landscape classes are outdoor water use represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bosca service area. And outdoor water use reduction through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques can help conserve water and ensure that future water supply needs of our communities are met. And it is very substantial the difference between summer water use and winter. Okay. So Bosca offers a number of programs and Brisbane participates in quite a few of them. So if you're a Brisbane resident and you wanna save money, we have a Lawn Be Gone program. And that is you get a dollar rebate per square foot of lawn. If you take out your lawn and put in some, you know, um, more water drought tolerant planning and then we have a rebate for $150 if you install a rain barrel um, to collect the water from your roof and use it to irrigate your yard. And there's additional ways to save. There's a new revamped landscape program called the Rain Garden Expansion Program that just launched. And the city of Brisbane is also participating in that. And so if you live outside of the city of Brisbane, your city may participate in some of these programs and there be maybe a few more that I don't have featured on these slides. So if you go to bayareaconservation.org, you can get a full list of those programs. And there's more webinars coming up soon. We have um, we have Hold on, I just got a question that popped up. I, Michelle, I'll get your question in just a minute. Um, let me minimize that. Okay, so coming up next, there's a native plant and pollinator garden workshop tomorrow at seven. Gardening with succulents, October 24th at 10 a.m. So I think that's Saturday. Maintaining water efficient gardens and irrigation leak detection. That is October 31st, 10 a.m. Halloween class. Rain Harvesting 101 on November 2nd. Design it yourself, native plant landscapes on November 4th. An edible water-wise gardening for beginners on November 17th at 7 p.m. And rainwater harvesting on December 16th at 7 p.m. So let me go back here. So we had a question about the Lawn Be Gone program. Let me pull that back up. We had, does it matter what particular list of plants and shrubs that would qualify for lawn replacement? Um, you know what, Michelle, I do not 
know off the top of my head if I don't remember the details of that. I've only, I don't, um, I don't run that program through the city, but uh, I can find that out while Jennifer is doing her presentation and I can go see if we have a flyer for that and I can share that. But if you want to, um, if you want to go back to take a minute and jot down the, uh, go here, the, um, where to go? I went the wrong direction. The Bay Area Conservation.org, which for sure have details. And once we get started with the presentation, I will go, um, I'll go see if I can find the brochure on that. Okay, so other things you guys can use as resources is BayAreaGardening.org. They have some thirsty lawn to water efficient landscape. And so they have a whole bunch of guides for the Bay Area of how you can handle this. All right, so I'm gonna give it just a minute. We'll take a short break and I'm gonna go see if I can find that flyer and we'll wait for Jennifer to get um, ready and we will be back. So let me go run. I know right where that flyer, there she is. All right, so we're ready to go. I will move on to the next slide and introduce Jennifer and then I will go look for that flyer and I can type an answer to you. Perfect. All right, so Jennifer Allstrand, she is with westwindsucculents.com and Jennifer's the owner of Westwind Succulents and she's lived in the Bay Area her whole life. After studying painting and sculpture at California College of the Arts in Oakland, she worked at Macy's in San Francisco doing window display for seven years. She started growing succulents on a windy rooftop in West Oakland, found herself only wanting to be with her plants. She began using succulents as her artistic medium, which inspired her to create West Wind Succulents in 2017. Her plants are now grown in Lafayette and used in eco-friendly succulent decor for weddings and special events, custom arrangements, and small-scale landscape design. She teaches workshops and classes on crafting with succulents, propagation, and plant care. She does other virtual succulent DIY classes. She sends out materials for crafting and walks people through the steps. These are great for birthdays, holiday parties, and corporate events. So now Jennifer is gonna start sharing and she's gonna take over for a minute. I will monitor the questions and then we will um, go from there. So there you go. Thanks, Jennifer. Oh, and I need you to enable screen sharing. Okay, and then, um, I'll panel, okay. All right, see if that's, you should be good to go now. Okay, yeah. Perfect. All right. Okay. All right. Yep. I can see your screen. Okay. Great. Um, I'm going to mute. Great. Okay. Good. All set. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jennifer. Thanks for joining. Um, here's just a few photos of some things that I do. I do wedding succulent decor and, like Bob said, classes and. This is a photo of my nursery in, Wall in uh, Lafayette. Um, and yeah, I, I love growing succulents. I, I love propagating is probably my favorite part. Um, it's a great way to get to know your plants. So let's get started. So yes, landscaping with succulents is super fun because they're so forgiving. Um, and there's just, the variety is just so vast. So, um, yeah, I'm like Bob said, he's going to field questions and I'm going to try to like stop every few slides and see if there are any questions. Um, and I tend to kind of like bounce around. So bear with me. And if, um, yeah, if you have questions, just like, please feel free to jump in because I get excited and then uh, <laughs> um, I might get off topic, but okay. So with that precursor, here we go. <laughs> um, so like Bob said, I do, I, you know, I started as an artist. So first and foremost, I feel like I, you know, growing plants is satisfying to the eye, right? It's, um, it, to me, is kind of like a, a blank canvas. So I first and foremost think of um, good composition. So these are kind of some of the elements of good composition. You want to have a uh, balance and variation of color, texture, sizes, and shapes. These elements should create good movement, which is the placement of your plants, dictating how your eye moves through the garden. 
or how it flows. So you can see these things, for example, there's really good movement. You have some like three nice big um, sharp focal points and then all of these other colors kind of flow through really well. And same with this one on the right. Um, these Echeveria in the foreground are really lovely, a lot of different texture than everything else in the background. And so I'll kind of go through all of these different things that we talked about with other examples. Okay, so color is probably the most immediately impactful. Um, although this is a pretty restricted color palette, it's extremely powerful. Um, these colors really speak to each other. Um, bridge colors are something I like to think about when I'm doing any, any art piece, when I make bouquets and landscapes. Um, if you have two different colors that are like very different, a bridge color is kind of that, that color in between that bridges it together, and makes everything feel cohesive, right? So like if you just had this golden sedum and this um, looks like a Senecio, this blue toxic Senecio, that might be pretty jarring if that's all you had, but because you have the, this like golden color, this darker blue, that bridges those gaps and really makes everything speak to each other well. Um, textures and shapes, uh, almost as powerful as color. Um, you can see this sedum has a really fine soft texture that contrasts nicely with the sharp leaves of the agave. So that's something that I think about a lot is, you know, is, is something skinny and grassy? Is it round and soft? And I try to usually try to break those things up so that things don't get lost, if that makes sense. So like, for example, if I put an aloe right next to an agave, you, they might read as one thing. And, and I, because I love all, all of my plants so much individually, I really want them each to kind of shine on their own. So that's something to think about. Uh, okay, movement and grouping. So placement of your plant dictates how your eye moves through the garden. Um, the seemingly random placement and use of rocks makes this landscape look very natural although it's like really minimal, or I should say because it's really minimal, I feel like the placement of the plants is even more important. Now, some people really like a modern look that is like very clean lines, your hedges are, are um, you know, trimmed to be like a box and that's totally all fine and good if that's what you're going for. Um, but if you want it to look a little bit more natural and a little bit more organic, the placement is really important. So see how these things are kind of like scattered around. They're not in a line. They're, you know, they're not in a row altogether. They have nice movement because of that. Um, and same with this on the right. There's, there's a lot of negative space, which is also really good for movement. It allow, allows a place for your eye to rest. So it's not just like plants, 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 plants. Um, so yes, those are all those are all super important. Oh, and uh, a use of rock as a chop dressing, like I said, like this kind of negative space rocks, even big rocks can add a nice kind of focal point or like a rest from all the texture of plants. Um, so here's um, some examples of like, is is this a good design? So. Of course, just like anything visual, it's all up to individual taste. So it's hard to say if anything's wrong or right or, and good and bad. But for me, what my criticisms of these gardens would be is that this one right here, I feel like is a little bit stripey. Although there's good, uh, there's a good balance of different textures. It's kind of like boom, 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 like stripey, stripey, stripey. And it is a little bit distracting in that regard and it doesn't look very natural. The other criticism of this I would say is these aeoniums on either side of these agave are kind of swallowing the agave. So this would be a great opportunity to trim back all of these aeoniums surrounding, give those agaves room to breathe and be seen and then give away all those agave or aeonium cuttings to your neighbors. <laughs> Never throw away succulents. Sharing is caring. They'll, they'll keep growing. Um, okay, so then this example, again, I feel like is really stripey. The rocks kind of become the star of the show, right? So like when I look at this, all I see is the rocks. I don't see the plants as much and it's just like two perfect 
I would not surround this aloe with rock so perfectly, and I would not use, a, you know, this harsh line of white and red rocks. Meh, meh. <laughs> uh, but I'm not opinionated. <laughs> okay, and then this picture, my only criticism of this would be scale. So that's something else is like, if you're going to use rocks, think of the scale. These rocks to me look way too big. They almost, when you first look at them, look like succulents and like not in a good way. And it's just kind of distracting. It looks, it looks awkward. They're shoved up really close to the succulents. I don't know. I, I would, I would lean on the little rocks to kind of make them disappear and not be so distracting. So yeah. So another thing to consider is size and height or like scale. Um, so this is a great garden. I think this is amazing. It has a ton of different colors, a ton of different um, textures, but it has different sizes. So it has big agave, little clusters of other things, and you have a nice break of areas of rocks. Um, this is an even better example of height. So depending on where you're putting in your garden, it's really important to think about things like your backdrop, right? So this fence is like a super obvious immediate backdrop or your house or whatever it may be. And I would try to put tall things back there and then shorter things in the front. So that again, so that you can see everything. So there's no point in having a super awesome Echeveria way in the back against the fence because it's not gonna be seen. So that's another thing to think about. Um, and then just a few other things to consider when you're designing is um, it's good to create focal points, vignettes, or like little moments is what I call them. So for example, this fountain is a really nice way to add a little like focal point and that you kind of work around that. Um, sometimes it can be hard even for me to, you know, just if you're just putting in plants, it's nice to kind of pick a few places that are kind of like where you want focal to be, like your favorite agave, something really colorful, just kind of like pick a few moments to focus on and then have everything else kind of blend together, if that makes sense. Um, using rocks, I kind of mentioned a bit before, it's visually really interesting as well as it makes your succulents happier. Um, they like nestling naturally in and around rocks. Um, it's really nice for top dressing. Um, speaking of water, if you put um, top dressing of rocks, it helps when you water, if you're doing overhead watering for the water to not splash around, it kind of like settles nicely and goes down into the ground instead of like bouncing off leaves and stuff like that. Jennifer, can you explain what a top dressing is? Oh yes, so like, like mulch or rocks, anything that you use to kind of cover bare ground would be a top dressing, yeah. So it's good, mulch is good, great too. That's good for water con conservation as well because it, it traps a little bit of moisture, but as long as you have well-draining soil, it's um, not gonna trap moisture too much for succulents. If, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so let's see, oh, one other thing, um, front yard versus backyard. This is kind of, this is all, of course, all up to you, but this is something my mom taught me. She, she's a landscaper as well. And she would always say how she feels like the front yard should be kind of like, what you wear to work. <laughs> it's like what you want your neighbors to see. Your first impression, you know, it's usually less functional. It's usually a little more formal. Um, so you might want to think about like, like what do you want to see when you come home? And then the first thing you see, you know, so like think of that when you're doing your front. And then on the contrast to that, your backyard is probably where you hang out, can be a little less formal, experiment more, um, try new things, like have fun with it. Um, but that, you know, that's just a little tip. <laughs> and then, oh, another thing, be safe with spikes. Consider not doing super sharp things near a pathway, near a doorway, um, and just be careful because as much as they're really cool looking, you know, like small animals, children, um, you know, they, some of them can be really nasty. So be careful where you put those. And then don't be afraid to remove things that aren't working. Um, Sometimes it's really hard to get a clear vision of what to do if you have a bunch of existing stuff, especially if it's a bunch of stuff that isn't healthy, it's been there a long time, 
it takes a lot of water it just don't be afraid to just rip stuff out before you start coming up with a plan to just get kind of a blank canvas is, is a good suggestion um maybe i'll stop there since i've covered a lot of stuff are there any questions let me see i am i don't think so right now okay um, this is kind of all the art stuff right now so <laughs> yeah no and we okay. We've okay, cool. A few more participants, so that's good. Awesome. Um, okay, so something else to think about is companion plants. So even if you're wanting to do mostly succulents, I do recommend mixing it with other great companion plants. I um, mean, these are a few examples of like big shrubs or small trees that will add a little bit of a break from a sun from the sun. If you have a really, really sunny garden, yes, cacti and succulents can handle full sun, but a lot of succulents actually prefer a little break from the sun. So it's not like eight hours straight of direct sun. Um, you'll get a lot healthier plants and have to water less if you have a few larger things that kind of you know take take a give give some shade throughout the day and so yeah. those those trees that you show there can they handle our wet winters uh yeah as long as yeah i think so as long as you're not like you as long as you have well-draining soil is like the number one thing but the great thing about if it was if, if we had a wet winter um just don't water yeah. once once things are established yeah just let let the, the rain do the job yeah um, these are some other great companion plants. I love, I think my number one favorite thing to mix with succulents are grasses. They are such an, a contrasting texture. So this one's called blue fescue. It's awesome. There's also really cool ones that have like nice little feathery tips to them. Um, and once those get established, most grasses are very drought tolerant. So that's another pro. Um, protea are amazing. They like really sandy, really bad soil. So don't ever fertilize protea if you're gonna use them. Um, your native soil should probably be really good and fine for them. Um, just don't fertilize. And, um, and like also too, I recommend using this if you find that you have like really, really poor soil that has like no nutrients in it, you're not able to grow many things, pop a protea in there and I bet you it'll be really happy. Um, and then manzanita, there's so many kinds of manzanita. Um, this one, I believe, is our native. Those are insanely drought tolerant, which is once established as well. And I'm going to pipe in. There's a fun fact. I think San Bruno Mountain has its own manzanita that is not found anywhere else. Ooh, that's I, great. I talk, there's a presentation with some biologists. There's a San Bruno Mountain manzanita that's... San Bruno, I'm going to have to write that down. Oh, well, I guess it'll be recorded. I don't, yeah. Cool. So, cool. Like, for all your Brisbaneans that are joining us. <laughs> okay, so now I will kind of go over um, a little more about succulents and their growth and things like that. So defined only by the water stored in their leaves, succulent plants have a tremendous variety of colors, textures, growth habits, and forms. Ease of propagation, drought tolerance, and low maintenance requirements make these plants the perfect choice for practically everyone. They want to live. <laughs> they naturally grow in incredibly unforgiving climates, so they have found ways to ensure their survival. They are very forgiving and the perfect plant for the beginning gardener. Um, there are two general types of succulents. There's hardy succulents and soft succulents. Don't really like to like put them in categories, but this is just kind of a way to help understand um, and just be aware that there are some succulents that will freeze um, and, and like different, and the different, um, you know, light requirements kind of have to do with the, these sort of things. So hardy succulents are considered, they're uh, known for being cold and frost hardy, great for outdoors, full sun to part shade, great for cold winter climates. Um, they can survive in zones five or colder. Most common genera of Sempervivum, Hen and Chicks, and Sedum are good examples of that. Um, and many of these ones do have really good spring and fall, oops, spring and fall color. 
Um, and then soft succulents are known as tender succulents. Of course, those are the really good ones <laughs> like Echeveria and um, like um, Senecio and things like that. Um, these have an extraordinary range of color, shapes, and sizes. And the thing with freezing, if you do tend to get freezing, there are things you like ways to handle that. You can either keep them in pots so that you can move them to close to your house or under an overhang that usually protects from freezing. Or you can even put like a sheet or some people even construct little like boxes for the winter if you really have to have something that is um, sensitive to your environment. Um, here's more examples of hardy succulents, some pervivum, sedum. This is a great sedum. I like to use that in many iterations because it's really small. It's like a ground cover and it's super durable and has a really uh, small root system too. So if you have like a little rock garden you want to do, you can and only have a small amount of soil, they would grow great in between rocks. And then Apuntia are the awesome cacti you see that could get really big. Um, and here are some soft succulents, very popular string of pearls, can be grown indoors with enough sun, Echeveria, and golden jade is a good one. And jade, of course, is, um, it is cold hard or uh, sensitive, but it's pretty tough also. So um, you might be able to get away with that in colder areas. Okay, so this is my favorite part. Um, I won't, I'll try not to go off on too much of a tangent with this because we, we did a whole class on this last time. And I remember I went over the hour. <laughs> but anyway, um, this is, this is an example of how I propagate my succulents. This is one of my cutting trays. Um, there's a lot of different methods. It depends on basically the growth pattern of the plant. So depending on the plant, you can do cuttings, dividing, harvesting, pups or seedlings and plantlets or the leaf propagations. Cuttings are the easiest. So here's some more examples of when I say seedlings. So certain plants like the mother of millions varieties, um, which a lot of Colancho have this, have little seedlings on the tips and they actually drop off and will, and will root themselves and grow more and more and more hence mother of millions. Um, those are super great in yards because of course, when they fall, there's a lot, lots of space for them to go nuts. Oops. Um, this Crassula tegragona is awesome. And it's really cool because it, um, right around the top little bit, it naturally has a little breaking point. So sometimes I've even just kind of brushed over it and the top will just fall to the ground with me barely even touching it. And that is just its way of figuring out how to propagate itself easier. So like if an animal were to walk by it, instead of just breaking and, and being hurt, it actually is a way to make more. So they're very smart. <laughs> um, the other way is dividing um, or call them dividing pups. Uh, little babies as I call them. <laughs> so this is a really great aloe that I waited until it got nice and big and full of pups and I just carefully kind of pulled them apart. So this is a fun way if you have a big plant in a pot and you want to use it in your yard, you might want to consider making little like taking off some babies and putting those in other places in your yard and letting it kind of spread around. Another example of um, aloe, these were like ripped out of someone's yard and they were giving them away on Craigslist. Um, and I potted them all, even though the roots were like this long and I wanted to put them in pots this big, I just cut off half of the root, put it in a pot and they didn't care and they're, they're happy now. So don't throw away your succulents, put them on Craigslist. <laughs> Um, and then this is uh, super popular on like social media and stuff is the leaf propagations. You'll see like fun patterns that people put them in. Um, I'm pretty impatient, so I don't tend to do this. Uh, it takes a long time. Um, and this, you're gonna have to kind of like mist it every few days to really encourage these to get going. But it's certainly fun if you wanna try it. So then on the, go back on the right, that picture. Um... Yeah. They turn right into that new, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, they will just, from the tip of their leaf, they will just start growing a new rosette. It's that's, crazy. Yeah, that's 
Those are cool. It's amazing. Yeah. And it doesn't always work. It's like usually like a 75% success rate, I'd say. And you have to, the important thing with this is you have to have a very clean break. Your leaf has to be like perfectly intact for it to work. Okay, so here's an example of healthy roots. This is a beautiful sight to see for me. <laughs> um, they're firm, um, oftentimes fuzzy or hairy, bright. Um, if when you're planting your succulents and you notice anything that's mushy or dry or brown, make sure and pull them away. A lot of times people think like dead bits of succulents that are falling and on top of their pots or dead things in the dirt is like, oh, that's nutrients, right? It's like compost. Not really. A lot, it can, especially if something's rotting, um, it can actually like encourage more rot in other areas. So it's nice while you have the chance, if you see that, just kind of clean it out and start fresh. Okay, well draining soil is important for succulents. Um, a lot of, I find the more, the more I plant things in the ground, I realize how really not finicky succulents are. I would say unless you had like really soggy soil and really clayey soil where it's just super dense, you should be fine. Um, but if you, if not, you can add things like lava rock is the best for in landscaping in the ground for two reasons. One is it um, looks better in contrast with your soil, right? It's not as like speckly as if you put in pumice. Um, and then the other thing is it's not quite as nutrient rich as pumice, which is totally fine because when you're planting things in the ground, you already have all of this biodiversity happening, minerals in the soil that, so you don't really need to worry about that. And so I would definitely recommend going the lava rock route if you need to add drainage to your ground. And then if you're doing succulents in pots, either buy succulent mix, this is, pumice is generally in any succulent um, soil mixes that you buy in the store. Um, what I do is I buy really good potting soil and then I just mix in pumice. But you know, this is because I'm growing almost everything in pots and pumice is better in pots because it has more nutrient in it. So every time you water, the water passes through that pumice and it releases into the soil. So it's almost like not instead of a fertilizer, but it's just really good for things in pots. If you, if you want to have things like in your yard or on your patio, it's nice to have that in there. Um, a lot of people use perlite, which is this down here, which is actually super heated pumice. It's like, it's like pumice popcorn, <laughs> um, which is exp expanded volcanic glass. Um, I only use this for propagating. I would not recommend putting it in your ground because it is so light that over time it actually just like floats to the top and like blows around and eh, it's just not, it's not great. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and then this is a little soil test you can do. Um, there's all kinds of tutorials for that online if you're interested in seeing how fast your soil drains. Okay, let's see, how are we doing on time? Uh, we are at 7.35, so we've got oh. a few more minutes. Okay, great. Okay, so watering succulents. Um, general rule of thumb is to water once per week in pots, water deeply enough for water to run out the drainage hole and wait for the soil to fully dry before watering again. That is number one rule for watering. Always wait till your soil is bone dry before you water again. In ground once a week is good, um, in hot summer months, and then less in cooler months or when it's raining. Um, drip, drip systems are the best way to water. They're, they're the most efficient. They waste like no water because the, the water is going straight to every plant that you want. Um, a landscaper or like irrigation specialist can do that for you. Um, but if you have like a smaller garden or a very succulent heavy garden, um, you could totally just hand water. Um, I, if you have time, I like doing it just for like a check-in with my plants. Um, it's a really good way to, well, A, it's a good way to like 
de-stress and just kind of do something nice and calm and simple and be outside, especially right now. My God. Um, but I will find so many things that I don't notice with my plants when I'm watering because I'm going around and I'm looking at each one. And sometimes I'll notice like a bug that I didn't see before, or I'll notice that something's not getting watered enough or, you know, like pull off dead things. Just, it's just, a, it's nice. I like it. I recommend it. <laughs> um, okay, light. Here is a picture of my nursery. So my nursery is, although it's surrounded by a bunch of oak trees, the space where my succulents are growing is pretty much full sun. Uh, so what I did is created this kind of shade structure and put shade cloth that's about a 40% cloth um, that lets about 40% of light through or shades 40% of sun. Um, and this just is a lot, I mean, this isn't Lafayette, um, so it does get really, really hot. Um, and it, so this is something that you should take into consideration too with your, with your lights. For example, something in let's say Berkeley where it's usually not getting above 85 and, um, it doesn't get super cold. Like you're, you're, you're not, you're not battling heat as much. So like you could probably grow things in Berkeley in full all day sun that you might not grow in full all day sun in like somewhere like Modesto where it's just hot and dry and you get like over hundred degree days, multiple days in a row. So that's, that's it's, a, it's a balance. You're gonna take those two things into consideration. Um, so, and especially things like Echeveria, those more delicate succulents, they really are gonna wanna break for the sun. If you don't have big trees and you wanna do pretty things like Echeverias, I recommend putting them next to something bigger and just the act of having it kind of next to something big that like late after, like morning, it'll get all this morning sun. And then as soon as it gets the hotter part of the day, it's gonna be shaded by your big agave or whatever it's next to. So that can help cut some of the sunlight. Um, so just think about all of those things when you're placing stuff. Um, doo, 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 doo. They will need less frequent watering and a bit of shade. Yeah, so um, that's also another benefit is if they're not in blasting full sun all day, you're gonna have to water them much less because they're not gonna dry out as fast and they're not gonna be as stressed. Um, so things to look out for with a light is not enough sun in your succulents will stretch out, which is called atoliation. So this is my number one complaint I get from people who are trying to grow succulents inside. They're like, or sometimes they'll say, oh, my succulent's doing great. It's super long. And I'm like, is it big or is it long and atoliated? So if you have this great, like pretty little echeveria that's all nice and compact, and then all of a sudden it's like stretching out and it's tall and all the leaves are spread apart, it's literally reaching for more sun. It's, it's when you see the leaves spreading apart, it's actually trying to increase its ability to get sun in every area that it can. So, and on the opposite side of that, if your plants are getting too much sun, they will, A, will sunburn, um, but they will actually also like curl up. Like I had a aloe that was in way too much sun and it's beautiful leaves that were once like this, not only started cupping, but the whole thing kind of just like, uh, like curled up so that it was getting as little sun on all of its surface as possible because it was just too much for it. So listen to your succulents, they'll often tell you what they want, which is great, which is why they're so good for beginners because it's just a few simple things to look for and then you can figure out what's wrong before they actually die and you can make adjustments. And also what's great about them is like I was mentioning about chopping that root of that aloe, if you don't like where something is, dig it up. Ch chances are it's not gonna die. Like unlike something else, like I when I was first starting gardening and my mother-in-law's, I wanted to move this uh, rosemary that had been there for 15 years. And I thought I could just move it because I had been dealing with succulents <laughs> and it did not make it. So, but that's rarely gonna happen with, uh, with succulents, which is great. Why it's a good beginner plant. Um, oh, I skipped over this part. This is important too. 
if you have a succulent that's indoors or in a ton of shade and it's and you realize that it's getting atoliated and you want to move it into more sun do it slowly your your plants will burn like like people they will burn so you want to transition it slowly so like try if it's indoors move it outside under an overhang and then just kind of slowly move it out like day by day or every couple of days so that it can adjust to the light change. Um, sunburn will look like, usually it's different on every plant, but it's generally like a big blotchy dark spot, like an actual burn and it won't ever go away. You're just gonna have to like wait it out, wait for it to grow out. It won't kill it usually, but it just won't look pretty. Okay, so planting. Um, you can plant your succulents as close together or far apart as you'd like. Um, they don't mind being cram, e crammed, even some prefer it. Um, when I do arrangements sometimes, it's amazing. Like I'll you know, do little like gift arrangements in pots and I'll cram a bunch of them in there. And then I swear it just, they're so happy that they all just kind of get bigger and fuller and they just, they like it. I mean, they naturally grow in, places that are you know rocky and not a lot of area to grow so I think it just is you know feels natural to them um be mindful of the depth your succulent was planted in when you receive it so that's a good like if you're not sure that's a good way to see so when you take it out of your pot just try to kind of like match how it was planted um, if it's planted too high the delicate flesh that hasn't been exposed to the sun before can burn um, like if it's raised up, you know, so like all of this area that was kind of tucked down into the soil, if then all of a sudden it's out, um, it can burn and it can damage it. Actually, that can really damage it a lot and it might not make it, especially if it's on the stem, which is pretty important. Um, also, it can become unstable and break and like fall over, which will damage the connection between the succulent and its roots. So Again, everything with this is a balance. There's no clear rules. Um, I've had things where it's hard. I have to kind of pick between, do I want it to be planted low? And some of the leaves are kind of touching and it might rot, but also, well, at least it won't tip over because I might want to plant it here. But if it really doesn't seem like it's staying, you kind of have to pick which, which one to go for. I would tend to err on the side of keeping it from falling over is the most important thing. Um, because if it is planted too low, meaning like it's little leaves are like in the ground, um, the, the, the leaves touching the soil can rot. So that's no good. Um, and then with this, with this in mind of um, height, you can use what you receive them as a guide, but oftentimes, and what I'm seeing more and more is when you get plants from like a nursery or especially places like Home Depot that may have really good deals on plants, but their plants are not taken very well care of, they tend to always plant them too low. I can't tell you how many times I get stuff from them and I immediately repot it or put it in the ground and I plant it much higher than they plant it. They plant it super low. And a lot of times there's tons of rotted mushy leaves all around the bottom get clean all of those out, get rid of them and plant it higher. So just something to be aware of. Um, succulents will tolerate losing quite a bit of the roots, like I said before, and still thrive. So don't worry if some break. If, yeah, if you, if you wanna play with that, you wanna put it in a place where you can't really fit it, try hacking off half the roots and, and doing it. I mean, I won't, like you shouldn't, but you can't. That's basically what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so that's it, that's it actually. So if there's cool. anything I missed or skipped over too fast. We have a few minutes for questions and I don't see too many questions right now. Um, okay. But I had, I was thought of one. So are there any succulents you mentioned, you know, different sizes, are there any succulents like that will grow particularly fast if you wanted to fill in an area? Um, oh like, yeah. Like what, what would be a fast growing? You know, if that's you want to get a bush. big bushy or tall, do you recommend any? Mm, big bushy. <sighs> like we have a big jade tree that we had to take out. And then we now we have, we built a shed, but we're doing some planting areas and we want to. You want something big in, quickly. But, yeah. um, anything in, 
in that family is generally a good grower. So that's uh, the Crassula family. And there's a bunch of those. Um, there's a few varieties of Calancho or some people say Calancoe that are also really good. That There's one called Lavender Scallops that I love and gets bushy and big and kind of takes whatever you give it. It's really hard to rot and really hard to dry out. So it's super tough. Um, another one that's good, but it's, it's good for fast growing, but it's not tall. But one of my favorite things is Crassula watch chain. There's a, uh, there's also a giant version, which is just like, it's a little bit thicker around, but those are great and almost grass like, and are like, they will just go like a weed and they're awesome. So I would recommend those. Okay, we have a couple more questions popping up now. Mm -hmm. So the first one, can you plant under a tree that drops lots of leaves in the fall? Oh uh, yeah, as long as you keep up with getting the leaves out, um, just so that, cause what will happen if the leaves are there, you might rot whatever they're touching. Um, as long as it's not really, like I would say, especially if there's a bunch of leaves and then it rains, then definitely make sure you're on top of getting them out. Um, Otherwise, if it's dry out, it's not as big of a deal, but not recommended because you're blo you're going to be blocking um, light from getting to the succulents. Okay, and somebody else had a similar comment that they had succulents under a tree, but the leaves kept falling on them, covered them, and they want to move them, but they do get sunburned. So you're going to have to just pack, move them around, I guess. Yeah, maybe try just moving them out a little more so they're not right under the tree. But like I was saying, they're still getting a little bit of a break of some of the full day of sun, if that makes sense. Yep, okay. Um, oh, I think I accidentally. Um, um, hold on. So then one was, uh, do you have any tips for propagating succulents, single leaf propagation as well as snipping a small piece off of a larger succulent? You, we hmm. did have a whole webinar on that, but do you wanna give a couple quick Go over that yeah. again, some bullets. Yeah, the, the leaf thing is fun. There's a couple ways to do it. Let me go back to that slide. There's a couple ways to do it like this. Um, you can see this is, this is like the best way to do it. It's just a little more time consuming is if you actually kind of poke the leaf down into the soil a little bit. I like doing it at an angle like this. So not straight up like this, but just a little bit sideways like this. That way, when your guy starts to put off roots, it's already gonna be planted, right? Some people do it where they just lay the leaf like flat on some soil and then they root out into nothing. Then you're gonna have to tuck those roots down into the soil. So it's like, it's a little more work, I guess. Um, so I like doing it this way. And then what you're gonna to wanna to do is, this is when I would recommend using a perlite mixture. So I would get cactus mix from the store and I would also get perlite and I would mix them together and probably do about like, I don't know, like 60% soil, 40% perlite. And what the perlite is good for is keeping the soil, and this is also true when you do cuttings, is it keeps the soil really nice and fluffy and it prevents when you water it from it from compacting. So when you stick your cutting in or your leaf in, the roots can grow super, super easily. It's not like fighting against really thick, tough soil. It just like pops out like it's nothing. Um, and then watering for this, I would either use a, especially if you're doing it indoors and in like a bright window, I would just use a spray bottle and do it like every other day. Um, not soak it, but just give it like a nice mist. And then if it's outside, what I do is I have it in kind of a shady area. And when I'm watering my other stuff, I'll just kind of give it a quick like sprinkle. But make sure it's gentle because you don't want to just, you know, um, they're just laying there. So you don't want it to just like go nuts, um, like get, get disrupted and move and any roots that are, that are in there move around um, and do it every every few days, every couple days, depending on the time of year. Okay, and we have a couple more questions that came in. So we need to get to Linda next, but Michelle had one that is relevant to this slide. She said, when you have the leaves as close together as you show in this picture where they're all in the, um, they're all in the potted in the perlite and soil, mm -hmm. she said, will the roots tangle up with one another as they start growing? 
Oh, that's a very good question. No, not at all. Just because they're so, it's they're so small and slow growing. By the time they get big enough like this, like see the roots on these guys, they're still not very substantial. So by the time they're substantial enough, you're going to move them anyway. And honestly, too, looking at this, like some of these are pretty tight together. That's why I tried to stagger them so that when they do start popping a little rosette, they kind of have a space to do that. But the reason I did it so tight is that I know that only about like 75% of them make it. A lot of them will like just get rotten and, and, uh, and, um, and you'll want to take those out anyway. So this was kind of the like pack it in knowing that, um, knowing that you will have to move some or lose some. Okay. We have a couple more. So Linda wants to know if, She's got a planter box um, that gets morning shade and afternoon sun. And is there a better variety to plant in morning shade, afternoon sun on a planter box under her window? Um, where, where do you live? If you're still with us, Linda, go ahead and type where you live. Oh. And, and uh, I mean, basically it depends. It's like the same thing. It depends on how hot it gets. So, um, Late afternoon sun is always the hottest. So if you have something a little bit delicate, um, morning sun is better. Um, but experiment with it. See, see what see what works. Oh, she's in San Bruno, so that's not super hot. Oh yeah, great. Oh yeah, then you're totally fine. I wouldn't worry much about the um, afternoon sun. Okay, and then uh, Marianne wanted to know, um, when planning for landscape, installing drip systems, is that tricky because of how the succulents can spread over time? Um, no, not really. It's just like any other plant. Um, it'll, it'll work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, um, we just did some drip system in our yard and the little flexible hoses, it seems like you can move those around pretty good and poke another little dripper in them. Yeah, good. definitely. Those are great and pretty forgiving. Yeah. Well, cool. Is there any more questions? Type them now because we might wrap this up if um, I don't see any other open questions. Um, okay. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was- cool. Yeah. Um, and and let me know uh, if anyone has further questions, if you think of something later or you run into problems, um, My this is my website, westwindsucculents.com. Um, you can feel free to email me or follow me on Instagram. Sometimes I try to post like tips and tricks on there about care and um yeah happy happy planting oh I yeah that's this is helpful and uh, barbara said thank you to everybody so thanks for thanking us barbara yeah. oh there's more two more questions just came in oh okay. um oh great presentation thank you and this was great thank you so Yay. oh awesome good yeah. oh yeah so happy um and then, uh, yeah, another thank you. All right, well, awesome. another successful presentation. Yeah, experiment, experiment, experiment. That's and what, what succulents are good for. And so you're just Westwind Succulents on Instagram, that's all? Just yep. mm -hmm. yep. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, we got another, okay. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us. And if anyone has questions, they, um, if you go to Bosca's webpage where you registered for this, they have recordings and Jennifer did a wonderful, hour long just on propagating um, and maintaining succulents in the spring, we did that. So yeah. I think those are still available. I know all the ones this semester are available, but I think those should still be available. Okay. And um, Yeah, so and if not, reach out or like, I also do, I do these kinds of classes with like groups of people, like friends and family. Like we said, like the, I'm doing a lot of pumpkin classes right now where I like mail people their, their, uh, supplies and stuff and then we can kind of hang out and people ask questions then too so yeah we can, oh, that's such we a great can idea. hang out again virtually <laughs> all right okay okay well thanks everybody thank you jennifer thank you have a good night everybody take care yeah, everyone. good night bye bye <laughs> thanks jennifer that was awesome yeah thank you so much for having me bob all right take care catch you later see you talk to you soon bye bye